So good afternoon and welcome to the uh, DC office of the uh, Arctic Research Consortium of the United States. My name is Bob Rich and I'm the executive director. Thank you so much for coming out to our third Arctic Research Seminar Series here in Washington, DC. Um, Arcus has been working for more than 25 years to connect Arctic research across boundaries through communication, through coordination and collaboration. We're a nonprofit consortium of organizations and individuals interested in advancing inquiry, discovery, and understanding of this important region and informing sound decision making. This seminar series is designed to provide unique access to some of the leading Arctic researchers for federal officials, members of the DC policy community, and the broader public interested in the changing Arctic. The ideas shared here represent the cutting edge of what we're exploring and learning up north, and also, what does it mean for the US and the rest of the world? For those of you in the room here, I encourage you to take a look at the Arcus materials that you were handed when you arrived. You should have received a seminar evaluation, which is very important to us so we can learn how to improve the series and as we move forward. And we'd like you to return that to the registration desk when we're completed. Also, there's some information about Arcus, some of the services we offer to the research community and information on membership. Afterwards, I'd be happy to discuss with any of you um, any questions you have and would love to hear how we can best help you to succeed. We're currently joined by more than 50 and a constantly growing number of online participants from throughout the US and other countries. I noted uh, Russia, Greenland, Denmark, Canada, UK, in addition to uh, people here in the room. So for those of you on the webinar, my colleagues are available to answer any questions that you might have about Arcus or Arctic research and to forward to us here in DC any questions that you might have for Jeremy. Just type your questions in the box on the right. Whether you're here or online, we invite each of you to become an Arcus member. Currently, all types of organizations are eligible to become Arcus members, including academic institutions, government agencies, corporations, and indigenous organizations. Also, any individual who shares our enthusiasm about the importance of Arctic research is uh, also eligible to become an Arcus member. I invite you to join us. You can join online at www.arcus.org, or if you're here in DC, I can actually take your membership application right here after the seminar. I'd like to acknowledge our partners in this seminar series, the Consortium for Ocean Leadership, which enables us to use this excellent meeting space. Thank you also to the Polar Research Board of the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine for their planning and logistical assistance. And of course, I uh, definitely want to thank the uh, National Science Foundation Department of Polar Programs for major financial support to Arcus and to this seminar series. Now, let me introduce our speaker without any further ado. Dr. Jeremy Mathis is the director of the Arctic Research Program in the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Office of Ocean and Atmospheric Research. He's been doing research through the uh, NOAA Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory and as an affiliate professor at the Institute of Marine Science at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. He holds a BS in chemical engineering and a PhD in chemistry from the University of Miami. Dr. Mathis has worked in Alaska and the Arctic for more than 12 years and has published over 75 research articles on ocean acidification and the carbon cycle. He has a number of awards, which I don't want to go into the long list, but just to let you know that this includes the 2015 silver medal from the Department of Commerce. Jeremy's presentation today will be on using an environmental intelligence framework to evaluate the impacts of ocean acidification in the Arctic. Please join me in welcoming to the Arcus DC Arctic Research Seminar Series, Dr. Jeremy Mathis. Thank you, Bob, for that great introduction, and I want to thank Arcus for hosting this and for Judy uh, for doing a great job of uh, putting everything together for the logistics. As Bob mentioned, I am going to be talking about uh, a new concept that we've started thinking about when it comes to monitoring ocean acidification in the Arctic and specifically in Alaska, this environmental intelligence framework. The best way to advance the slides, guys. Okay, slide, uh, 
There you go. So what, what am I pushing? Try, try the advanced here again. Got it. All right. So for ocean acidification, before I get into a lot of details of what we're doing, I wanted to start with some basic definitions of what ocean acidification is. And for the people in the room, how many of you have at least heard of ocean acidification at this point? So that's great. That means we're doing a really good job. For everybody on the webinar, everybody in the room waves their hands. So hopefully you guys out in cyberspace uh, know this as well. But we just want to remember as we go through this that ocean acidification is the progressive increase in the acidity of the ocean as a consequence of rising carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere if that can be exacerbated by other regional processes. So ocean acidification is caused by the accumulation of man-made CO2 in the atmosphere that's absorbed by the ocean, but in some cases that ocean acidification can, can be exacerbated or worsened by other processes that occur uh, in the ocean. But if we think about CO2, and I think this puts it all in context for us, this is the carbon dioxide record in the atmosphere going back 800,000 years. And so you can see, for the most part, CO2 ranged between 200 and 250 parts per million, with a few excursions up to uh, 300 parts per million during very short time periods. And when you compare that to where we are today, uh, which is up above 400 parts per million CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere, and as of this morning, we're at 406 ppm based on the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii, you can see the excursion, how far outside the natural range of carbon dioxide levels we have reached in the atmosphere due to man-made activities. And just a very, sep uh, a very simple understanding of ocean acidification is, is that CO2 goes up in the ocean, the pH goes down, the water becomes more acidic. And as the water becomes more acidic, important carbonate ions, the building blocks that anything in the ocean used to build a shell, a coral reef, a crab, a clam, an oyster, uh, everything that we think of as shell building organisms can be impacted as the saturation states are decreased from the rising CO2 and the decreasing pH. But when we first started thinking about ocean acidification 10 years ago, we thought about it in terms of these thresholds where these aragonite saturation states when they reached a certain level, we said, oh, well, that's bad. So when we said aragonite gets less than 1.0, that's when we start to see impacts to organisms. But we know now that's not true. What we know from the numerous biological studies that have been done since then is that when these saturation states move outside of the natural range that the organisms are used to living in, we can begin to see impacts, whether they cross that threshold of 1.0 or not. And we already see lots of examples of this in the laboratory. And then there are some examples that we've already seen in the ocean environment from animals being impacted from this decrease in saturation state driven by ocean acidification. And the poster child for this has been the pteropod, which is a tiny uh, free swimming snail. It's about the size of your uh, pinky fingernail uh, in the ocean. And you can see from this uh, picture here what happens to the pteropod when they're exposed to these undersaturated or low aragonite conditions. The picture on the left is a healthy pre-industrial pteropod with a solid shell, uh, semi-translucent with a little snail swimming inside of it. The middle picture is where we are today, the CO2 levels that we're, we have in the ocean today. You can see the fractures in the shells and the crack starting to break down. And then finally, if you look out at 2050, where we think CO2 levels would be at that point in the ocean, this is a pteropod that's been exposed to those conditions. And so you can see the shell is almost completely disintegrated uh, and broken down. And so this is a real time example of how organisms in the ecosystem are being impacted by ocean acidification. And we've also seen in laboratory settings these same kind of responses from crabs and clams and oysters, the variety uh, of shell building organisms that struggle under these higher CO2, lower carbonate mineral concentrations. But all of the ocean is not created the same when it comes to ocean acidification. This is a figure that was just published a few months ago that shows saturation states in the global ocean for aragonite. 
and the warmer colors, the oranges and the red, mean saturation states are higher. So it's anti-ocean acidification, right? That means there's plenty of carbonate in the water for the shell builders to use. And so you can see across the, soft, the tropics and the subtropics, saturation states are, are relatively high, but it's in the polar oceans, in the Southern Ocean and then up in the North Pacific into the Arctic, that saturation states are naturally lower. And this is due to a few factors. One is being the water is colder in these regions, so colder water can naturally hold more carbon dioxide than warmer water can. So the, the saturation states in these regions are naturally lower. And there's also a freshwater component to this, that fresh water um, lowers the buffering capacity of ocean water, making it more susceptible uh, to pH change and lower saturation states. So because of this, before we ever started adding anthropogenic carbon into the environment, the polar oceans were already preconditioned to have lower saturation states, and I'll show you why uh, that's very important as we think about ocean acidification in these regions. But ocean acidification is more than just chemistry. Over a billion people derive all of their dietary protein directly from the ocean. These are people that go down, extract something to eat um, out of the ocean, and rely on that for their sole source of protein. And we also know that the population of the planet is increasing. We're up to 7 billion and growing quickly, so that the the reliance on ocean resources is going to continue to grow. We also know that energy consumption could increase by more than 50% by 2040. It's going to drive more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and into the ocean. We know that worldwide seafood consumption could increase uh, by as much as three times by 2030. As so the world industrializes, uh, as people have access to seafood, which has been a luxury for the most part, uh, that they now have uh, available to them. And this is a striking statistic, is that approximately 3 billion people currently live within 200 kilometers of the coastline. By 2025, that number is likely to double. So we're going to see this mass movement of people towards the coast, putting even more pressure on ocean resources. And in places like Alaska, that could have serious consequences because we see that important commercial and subsistence fisheries are co-located in places where these big changes due to ocean acidification are starting to occur. So with that in mind, we, we started thinking a lot about what ocean acidification was going to mean to the Arctic in general, but Alaska specifically, uh, because of the reliance on uh, the seafood industry up there. And so we started going out uh, and, and getting an idea of what the public was, was doing uh, and how they were interacting with the ocean. And we found, not surprisingly, that Alaska seafood is the primary source of protein between 30 and 46 percent of the population. The good news is, is we found that awareness of ocean acidification in Alaska is about three times higher than it is in the rest of the United States. So although it's going to be a challenge for Alaska residents uh, to deal with, the awareness of the problem uh, is higher, but we have to do a better job of con continuing to communicate that message. We also found that most respondents recognize that CO2 and human activities are the drivers of ocean acidification. We found that only 28% of respondents recognize that ocean acidification could impact Alaska disproportionately compared to other regions. So while they understand it's a problem, we need to do a better job of communicating what it means for the state of Alaska. And so that led us to do this study where we evaluated the risk from ocean acidification to the state's commercial fisheries. And so we found that highly productive Alaska commercial subsistence fisheries and subsistence fisheries are co-located in these places where a big chemical change is occurring. And we found that many of the organisms that live in these locations have shown a low tolerance to ocean acidification in laboratory settings. So while we don't have a smoking gun yet in the ocean uh, showing a, a big response to ocean acidification in the natural environment, we have laboratory studies that show that those animals that live in those places do have uh, negative uh, and oftentimes uh, very negative responses when they're exposed uh, to high CO2 conditions uh, in a laboratory environment. So we built this model to gauge this risk, where the risk of ocean acidification was dependent on three factors. The first one was hazard, which was just ocean acidification itself. The second one was exposure to those conditions. And then the third component, uh, which really got at the human dimension part of this, 
was the vulnerability of the population, where we went into different regions and we looked at things like size of the economy, industrial diversity, uh, individual income, food accessibility, and educational attainment. So we said, if you took a fishery out of a region or if a fishery declined in a certain region of Alaska, how would that region be able to respond based on a number of socioeconomic variables? And what we came up with uh, was not hugely surprising, but it did give us a roadmap for how to deal with the problem going forward. This map shows the relative index of risk around the state of Alaska. And so the reds are the regions that have the highest risk. So down in southeastern Alaska, uh, where there is the most extensive commercial fishing uh, that goes on, most of those communities are solely reliant or disproportionately reliant on the fishing industry, so a disruption in that industry uh, would have negative consequences for the economy as a whole. And then out in southwestern Alaska, where a number of subsistence communities rely directly on the ocean uh, for protein harvesting every year, are also at risk for ocean acidification. And then the yellow shows the moderate risk, and then the blues are the lower risk. So the interior parts of the state, that's because they're not directly reliant on the fishing themselves, and then up in the Arctic, the risk is lower because there's not any commercial fishing right now in the Arctic. And uh, the subsistence hunting that goes on is mostly related to marine mammals, uh, which, which we don't see as being impacted from ocean acidification at this time. But from holistically, if you think about the economic impact of the state, as the fisheries is one of the major drivers, if there was some decline uh, due to ocean acidification, it would obviously have a ripple effect uh, through the entire economy of the state of Alaska. And so with that in mind, we realize we have to build and sustain an ocean acidification observing network in the Arctic, but particularly focused on Alaska. And it has to be built around three pillars. Number one, understanding the processes and modeling scenarios and the ability to predict how the ocean is going to change. The second pillar is observing. We need sustained data and we need a way to make it cross-cutting so that we understand what's going on both chemically and biologically from the perspective of the ecosystem. And finally, the most important component of this is the third pillar, which is responding. We have to take what we've learned from our understanding and our observing, and we have to apply that to adaptation strategies, mitigation, uh, sustainability, and decision support around the state. And we have to do that uh, in a very integrated way. And so we had to think about this in terms of a nested observing framework. It's no longer good enough for a scientist just to go out and make an independent measurement and come home and spend a couple of years writing up their paper and then submitting it to a journal. We've got to integrate our measurements in a way that they're informing one another and we're getting more rapid feedback on the data that we're collecting. And so with this idea of nested observing framework, we start up at the high level using our satellites. We come down into the atmosphere uh, using our, our aircraft and our new uh, unmanned drones. We go down to the ocean with our cruises and our autonomous vehicles that we can deploy now, uh, particularly in the Arctic. And finally, that comes down to the human observer component, the communities that we're serving, uh, and the knowledge that they can both bring to the table uh, to help us understand the change that's occurring and the knowledge that they can take back from these studies that we're doing to help them um, make good decisions for their communities uh, and, and keep themselves uh, sustainable for the future. And so I'm thinking carefully about how we get to that point. How do we change the way we go about collecting uh, data in the environment? And the term that's been coined by our NOAA administrator, uh, Dr. Kathy Sullivan, is this idea of environmental intelligence, because intelligence has an immediate purpose. We're not collecting data, we're collecting intelligence. And we want to get through this intelligence cycle as fast as we possibly can. So the old construct was you went out, you did a cruise, you came home for a couple of years, you wrote up the paper, you published it in some journal, and five years later, you went back out and did a cruise again. So it took you five years to get through that cycle. I want to get through that cycle in five days or less, where we're returning our data in real time, we're doing immediate processing, and we're using that data to inform our next round of data measurement collection. So we go from collection to transmission to corroboration to analysis to application back to collection again as fast as we possibly can. So 
so that we are being responsive to the ecosystem as it changed. Because if we go out and plan a field activity based on data we collected five years ago, the system has changed so much in that time that we went into being measuring the feature or the process that we were trying to understand better when we went out five years ago. So the faster we can get through this intelligence cycle, the more responsive we'll be able to be to this ecosystem change. And so we thought about how we would apply this uh, in real time, this expedited environmental intelligence framework. And so we used as a case study, the Alupic Pride shellfish hatchery, which is an emerging industry in Alaska. The shellfish industry itself is trying to grow in the state of Alaska. And so down in Seward, which is about 90 minutes south of Anchorage, sitting in the northern part of the Gulf of Alaska, uh, they, they're trying to develop a shellfish hatchery that would provide the seed stock uh, for the shellfish farms that would grow around the state. And what was alarming is that these shellfish hatcheries had had big failures down in Washington and Oregon uh, back eight or ten years ago now because of ocean acidification. The major oyster uh, seed locations that provided the oyster seed for most of the country experienced a near collapse because of ocean acidification and it wasn't until uh, they worked with the scientific community to develop some monitoring uh, and some mitigation strategies for the hatcheries that they were able uh, to, to go back into production and, and to be successful. And so before Alupic Pride went too far down that road, we said, well, we want to make sure we understand what's going on in the environment so that you can be prepared to run your business uh, at this location. And so we developed uh, a study based around this environmental intelligence gathering framework where this is the location, uh, the red line here. I'm going to try to point at it so the people online can see. Uh, here, right up at the mouth of Resurrection Bay is where uh, the Alupic Pride shellfish hatchery is, and then this goes out, and then this is the Gulf of Alaska, the northern Gulf of Alaska, and this is Prince William Sound. Uh, so there's a lot of glacier runoff, a lot of fresh water that's coming in to the sound, a lot of biological processes and primary production that are occurring throughout the year, and all of that runs down uh, out here just outside the shellfish hatchery, and that's the water that's going to be pumped into the hatchery as they try to carry out their, their shellfish growing process. And so we wanted to know everything we could about what was going on as quickly as we possibly could. So we deployed six different platforms simultaneously. We used a ship, we used our ocean buoys, we used monitoring within the hatchery itself, we used our surface wave gliders, we used our subsurface slocum gliders, and we even installed instrumentation on one of the tour boats that does the glacier tours every day um, out of, um, out of Seward so that we could capture in real time. And so I'll walk you through some of that data. The slocum glider, this is the thing that looks like a torpedo, uh, profiles through the water column. So it goes from the surface down to some fixed depth. In this case, it was 200 meters and then it comes back up again and it's taking a number of measurements as it does this autonomously um, over uh, a number of months. And so we left this in the water for 135 days. It did over 5,000 dives covered a distance of more than 2,700 kilometers, and it made over a million observations. And so the figure there that you see is the aragonite saturation state uh, in the water for three week periods from May 23rd to the 27th, June 14th to the 20th, and then July 19th to the 26th. And that gave us a very good understanding of how the water over the continental shelf just adjacent to the shellfish hatchery was changing on a fairly large scale. This was a a coarse instrument that covered a lot of ground in a short amount of time and really gave us a very good snapshot of what was going on. And what we saw is that as we progressed into summer, the high CO2 water that was low in pH and low in saturation states was getting pumped out of the Gulf of Alaska up onto the continental shelf where it could be, um, where it, or it could wind up in the shellfish hatchery itself. So our second component of the environmental intelligence uh, gathering operation was this wave glider, which is about the size of a surfboard. It's got a full suite of instrument packages sitting on it, and it cruises around. It's remotely piloted uh, from the Pacific Marine Environmental Lab in Seattle. So it's literally a group of people with an iPad steering this thing around 24 hours a day. Uh, we also did a 130-day deployment with two of these. We covered 5,700 kilometers and made more than 5,000 observations 
all up in around Prince William Sound and then out onto the Gulf of Alaska Shelf. And because we were working on the surface now, what we were doing with these wave gliders was trying to understand the influence that the fresh water was having from the glacial melt that was coming off the large tidewater glaciers that sit in Prince William Sound, which I mentioned earlier, the fresh water can have an exacerbating effect on ocean acidification. So again, in the summer months when we saw the maximum amount of glacier melt occurring, we found that ocean acidification got worse even at constant CO2 levels because all this fresh water was being dumped uh, out of Prince William Sound and onto the continental shelf just outside of the shellfish hatchery. Another exciting thing we did was, it was uh, install those same instruments that were on the wave glider onto this glacier tour boat. Uh, the engineering staff at PMEL in Seattle were a little hesitant to drive the wave gliders up to the face of the calving glaciers. Um, and so we wanted that, you know, as close as possible. We wanted to get up and have that in member of, of the what was happening as the ice was melting off the glaciers. And we said, hey, these tour boats, you know, the tourists want up close and personal. So they go really right up to the face of these glaciers. And so by installing the instrumentation on this boat, we got daily observations of uh, the ocean acidification conditions throughout Prince William Sound as they did uh, their tour. And we found some very striking results in that at the, in the middle of the day, um, when the sun was out and it was warm and the ice was really melting, we found a really strong signal of these undersaturated waters that were coming off uh, and these plumes of glacial meltwater that were moving into Prince William Sound and ultimately out into the Gulf of Alaska. We were also, from a time series perspective, using our ocean acidification buoys, which sit in one spot uh, throughout the year and multiple years uh, and collect data. This is one that sits right outside of the mouth of Resurrection Bay, where the shellfish hatchery is located. And so you can see over the course of three years, uh, we were able to see how the saturation state changes uh, during the year. So it starts down to about 1.5 uh, in the wintertime, and then it goes up in the summer months because primary production, the phytoplankton that bloom, eat the CO2. They draw down the CO2 in the water, which is anti-ocean acidification, right? So that drives the saturation state up. And then as that, as that bloom dies, as the productivity starts to shut down for winter, the saturation states come back down again as CO2 levels in the water come back into equilibrium with the atmosphere. And then finally, we measured the water that was coming right into the hatchery itself. We installed a system uh, right at the intake uh, that was coming into the tanks that were going to be used uh, to rear the shellfish larvae. And we found that th for for a lot of the year, the saturation states are such that it would not be conducive to try to grow shellfish at this spot without treating the water beforehand. So we actually found that there's currently a five month window of optimum growth. So out of the year, there's only about five months where you could optimally grow shellfish at this location without treating the water that's coming into the hatchery. And because of the broader study that we had done, uh, around the region, we're able to, to determine that by 2040, so 30 years from now, or less than 30 years from now, um, we, that window will close. Uh, so throughout the year, if they want to grow shellfish at this hatchery, they will have to treat uh, the water coming into the facility. And so that was the Gulf of Alaska. That was, that was a great example of using that data in real time because it's all being transmitted back uh, via satellite, uh, we were getting it, we were processing, and we were looking at it, and that's how we were determining where we were steering our gliders and where we were telling the ships to go. Um, so that was uh, the, as real time as we could get. Now we need to apply that same concept to other locations in the Arctic. So the Bering Sea is another great example of the extremely valuable crab fishery, over a billion dollars uh, annually that comes out of the Bering Sea in the crab fishery, and a number of these species of crab uh, that are harvested in the Bering Sea have shown uh, tolerances or low tolerances uh, to ocean acidification in laboratory settings. We've already found some evidence. Uh, that's what this uh, circle is around here in our data set that we have of carbonate mineral dissolution over the Bering Sea shelf. So based on the measurements that we've taken, we've seen some evidence that carbonate minerals are dissolving in the water over the continental shelf of the Bering Sea, which is only about 120 or 150 feet deep. 
that's not supposed to happen. Carbonate's supposed to dissolve a thousand meters down in, in the ocean, in the deep ocean. When carbonate sphinks, it's supposed to dissolve at much deeper depths. And so the fact that we're seeing evidence of carbonate mineral dissolution over the Bering Sea shelf gives us uh, a real moment of pause and, and makes us uh, really motivated to go out and see what's happening in the Bering Sea with respect to ocean acidification. And so we deployed a mooring uh, in the Bering Sea to see how high CO2 levels got in the bottom waters uh, in that habitat where the crabs would be. Uh, and so we were able to get a, a, an instrument package out there for about five months, uh, two years ago, and the red dots on this graph, which have the axis on the right-hand side, are the CO2 levels uh, that we were able to measure. And so this, you can see the CO2 got above about 1,400 parts per million. And we know the red dotted line, the horizontal dotted line, shows you that when CO2 levels get above about 500, the saturation states for aragonite are less than one. And so you can see there's a, a quite a few months there where CO2 levels were such that aragonite was likely undersaturated in the bottom waters of the Bering Sea. And then we took this out uh, and we said, well, all these changes are occurring. We need to get a broader scale of what's happening. And so we were funded by the National Science Foundation a few years ago to do three cruises uh, through the Bering Sea and into the Arctic uh, for ocean acidification. And so what this figure shows you is the, the circles on the maps there are the locations where we stopped and actually made a measurement. And the shaded colors underneath are model output. So what we did, we used our data that we collected to validate uh, an Earth system model that was able to uh, give us output for ocean acidification. And we found that the model was doing a fairly good job uh, of capturing ocean conditions and ocean carbonate chemistry uh, throughout the Bering Sea and the Arctic. And so we were able to use the model out to it, output to project into the future how these oceans will change with respect to ocean acidification. And so what this figure shows is that the Beaufort Sea, which is the purple line on this figure, the Beaufort Sea is what sits to the north of Alaska, so the uh, northern Arctic coast of Alaska. The average aragonite saturation state in the Bering Sea is already less than one. So remember, we were talking about good and bad when we, we really start to get concerned when that aragonite saturation state approaches or drops less than one. So in the Beaufort Sea, the, the annual average saturation state is already less than one, and it's going down. By 2090, it'll be less than 0.5 based on these model outputs. The Chukchi Sea, which is the area to the sort of northwest of Alaska, so this area up here, um, is still above one uh, for an annual aragonite saturation state, but it'll drop below one by sometime around 2030, uh, and then will continue to drop. The Bering Sea, which is the green line where we said here, has a little bit higher value starting, um, but it will also cross this threshold by about 2070. So by the year 2070, the entire Pacific Arctic region, the surface waters in the U.S. Pacific Arctic will be perennially undersaturated in aragonite. It'll be below one all the time. And that's what this figure on the right-hand side shows you. These are the conditions in 2012. Here we are in 2050 where you see the Arctic has gone undersaturated, but the Bering Sea is still uh, above one. And then by 2100, the entire region is blue and purple. Uh, which indicates uh, we're below the saturation horizon. And we also know that this same process, that was the surface water, we also know that there's a vibrant benthic community, animals that live on the bottom, that are also uh, being exposed to these conditions. So we surveyed as best we could, uh, and this is some work uh, that a, a postdoc in Seattle is doing, uh, Jessica Cross, uh, and she's been able to uh, put this day together and show that wide portions of the bottom waters across the Beaufort, the Chukchi, the Eastern Siberian Sea uh, are already undersaturated in aragonite. Uh, and we know that at least 40% of the Chukchi Sea benthos, the, the benthic organisms, are exposed to bottom waters that are corrosive to calcium carbonate uh, for at least a few months uh, every year. So we know we had this great success with our, our Gulf of Alaska uh, hatchery study that we showed what we need to do this is advanced environmental intelligence gathering is really autonomous vehicles. And so 
we've got to move that concept into the Arctic. And so the good news is that these new technologies that are emerging do have that capability. So the carbon wave glider that we deployed in Prince William Sound uh, as part of the Gulf of Alaska study was deployed in the Arctic for the first time last year into the Chukchi Sea. Uh, it did very well. Uh, it got a very nice data set uh, in that area uh, that you see here. Uh, this is the tip of Alaska. Here's Barrow right here. So the area we were operating in uh, was over this part of the shelf. It returned very good data and it was returning this data in real time. Uh, so we could use the data that was coming back to steer the wave glider into the hot spots in the regions that we were very interested in. Another technology that's developing rapidly that we feel like is going to be a game changer for environmental intelligence gathering in the Arctic is the sail drone. Uh, it's shown in this picture here. It's about the size of a Hobie Cat sailboat. Uh, two or three of us could sit on it and ride it if we really wanted to. It's got a tremendous uh, size and payload capacity uh, for the amount of instrumentations it can hold. They deployed the sail drone last year out of Dutch Harbor. So they literally dropped it off the dock in Dutch Harbor. They sailed it out into the Bering Sea. They did a 97 day mission all the way up uh, into the Bering Sea and then back down again. They covered 7,600 kilometers autonomously. And these were pilots sitting in Seattle, steering this thing remotely. They dropped it out of Dutch Harbor. They sailed it back into Dutch Harbor and they never had to have a ship um, handle this thing. So. There is a plan to sail these into the Arctic uh, as soon as possible and also increase the payload and the instrumentation uh, that they're able to carry and measure. So I think between working with the sail drones and the wave gliders, uh, we could really begin uh, to fill in that data gap that we currently have in the Arctic. And that comes back to this environmental intelligence cycle. The more we can use these autonomous platforms, which return data in real time or near real time, we can get it processed and understand it within a few hours and then apply it back into the mission that that vehicle is flying at that time so that we can go to the places uh, in, in real time and, and have a really um, up-to-date understanding of how the environment is changing. And then that lets us begin to fill in the more complex pictures of this is where we see the direct effects of CO2 uh, and pH on organisms and then we can translate that uh, into the more complicated questions of how uh, those impacts could um, ultimately determine food web services uh, and ocean services and not just Alaska but across the Arctic uh, and the world as a whole. And so just in conclusion, we know that although progress is being made, uh, CO2 concentrations are continuing to rise uh, and they will likely continue to rise until the end of this century. Even if we cut fossil fuel emissions back dramatically today, CO2 levels would continue to rise uh, into the atmosphere just because of the momentum that's been built up to this point. We know that global and regional observations show that the Pacific Arctic will undergo rapid transformations due to ocean acidification, uh, and that's gonna put additional stress on already vulnerable ecosystems. Remember, ocean acidification isn't happening in a vacuum. Most of these ecosystems are already under stress from things like warming, uh, fishing, uh, and runoff. So ocean acidification is just going to be another stressor uh, that comes in uh, and adds to the challenges that these ecosystems are facing. We know that the surface waters in the Beaufort are the Bering and Chukchi Sea are already near undersaturation for aragonite and they will be perennially undersaturated by 2075. We know that 40% of the bottom waters of the Chukchi Shelf are undersaturated in aragonite for at least part of the year. And we know uh, beyond anything that we must effectively gather environmental intelligence on ocean acidification using all of the tools at our disposal. And that's really relevant for the state of Alaska. And I always bring this home to Alaska because we have to remember uh, why we're doing this. It's the stakeholders uh, that live up there uh, and that rely on the environment directly uh, that are going to be most impacted uh, from the changes that occur. And so from our work that we've done to this point, we know that the intensity, extent, and duration of ocean acidification in the coastal areas around Alaska will increase as anthropogenic CO2 continues to rise. We know that important commercial and subsistence fisheries are co-located in those places where that maximum change is going to occur. And we know that coastal and human communities in southeast and southwest Alaska are currently uh, faced with the highest risk because they are most reliant on those fisheries. And so there are some risk mitigation strategies that we can apply immediately 
we can do things like reduce other environmental stressors, reducing runoff, uh, reducing overfishing, uh, managing the ecosystems in an effective way. We know we can uh, diversify the economies uh, in these regions that have high and moderate risk going in with job training programs and opportunities uh, for communities so that they're not solely reliant on one issue and industry. We know we can increase access to alternative protein sources, uh, particularly in the native communities where you just can't go down. If you can't catch salmon, you can't go down to Safeway and buy chicken. Uh, it's just prohibitively expensive uh, in a lot of cases. And so we have to come up with better solutions of uh, thinking about how protein replacement could occur uh, if it was needed. And finally, the last thing is we have to reduce CO2 emissions. One through four on this list are just buying us time. Uh, the ultimate driver uh, of this will, you know, is and will continue to be CO2. Uh, so we have to bring CO2 levels down in the environment as quickly as possible. So with that, thank you very much, and I'll take any questions that you have. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Um, anybody here in the room have any questions? Yes. All right. I'll press the uh, button if you could so uh, you can be heard online. Hi, I'm Ari Gersman. I'm with UCAR, the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research. It's a great talk, uh, really interesting, the, the Alaska-specific material. Um, one of the things that I think would be interesting from your, to hear about from your perspective and, and also potentially to be added as one of the mitigation strategies is that by no means is ocean acidification a good thing, but are there potential new opportunities that ocean acidification presents, such as uh, species that will thrive. You mentioned how phytoplankton are big fans of uh, going to town on acid, uh, and and potential industrial uses. Could you, you could you start using ocean water as a detergent or some other uh, application uh, that could then you know uh, uh, allow the Alaskan economy to adapt. Well, I'll start by saying this. We know that there are going to be winners and losers in the ecosystem as climate change occurs. And ocean acidification uh, is an example of that, where if the calcifiers are impacted, things like seagrass and algae are going to like a warmer, richer CO2 environment. But I can't imagine a scenario where we would want to trade king crab for seaweed or seagrass. Um, so I think that the, the Simple answer is no. I don't think ocean acidification is going to provide economic opportunity. I think that the economies and the, the residents that live in those states are going to have to be adaptable to the changes that occur because of ocean acidification. And we are finding through the genetics work and the biological manipulation work that's being done now is that there are species uh, that are more tolerant to ocean acidification than others. So maybe those become uh, the clam or the oyster or the crab uh, that are raised and reared in certain locations is um, we may have to, to speed up the evolution process and import those animals that have the higher tolerance to ocean acidification into locations where the native species or some subset of the native species don't have that same level of tolerance for ocean acidification. So um, I think the opportunity will come down to adaptation rather than um, any new um, commercial advantage that ocean acidification will provide. But great question. Thank you. I've got a couple questions online here. Uh, David Douglas is asking, uh, what emission scenario were you using um, for projecting the acidification over the uh, 21st century? That was the mid-level uh, projection. So in the, if you think of the three IPC scenarios, that was the, the middle one. So the uh, not the worst case, but not the best case scenario. Thank you. Um, from uh, Guillermo Ayad says, uh, will the collection of observations of the proposed framework include food availability to different organisms? Yes, we hope that it includes that, and that was the part of that triangle or that pyramid uh, of observations that we included. We certainly want uh, this, this um, nested observing framework to include uh, the biological components and the, the prey uh, consumption components, because that's a, that's a missing gap or, or a gap that we're dealing with right now. Great. Um, any other questions in here? So. Yeah. So go ahead, uh, Pete. 
Peter Hill, Woods Hole. Um, you, told, you spoke about the Arctic Observing System network, and I'm wondering at your scale and scope of that. You're looking at it from an ocean acidification side, but clearly it goes, you know, the need goes beyond that. And can you give a little feel for what you're looking at in the scale and scope and what the process is in the federal government for pursuing that? Sure. So there have been a number of efforts underway to develop sustained Arctic observing, and, and they haven't been particularly successful to this point. But I think there's a, a new emphasis that, that we're, we're seeing right now to develop a sustained observing network in the Arctic. And if ocean acidification is part of the driver that takes us there, that's fantastic. There's already a go on the global ocean acidification observing network uh, that's growing. It has a number of countries participating into it now, uh, but it's, it's not in the Arctic. So if we can move go on into the Arctic, maybe that provides some basic level of framework that we can then build uh, a sustained observing network around because all the measurements we're taking for ocean acidification have relevance to other components of the climate system and vice versa. We wouldn't build a, 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 an ocean or a Arctic observing network without keeping ocean acidification in mind. So I think over the next few years, as we think about how to build and support sustained observing systems in the Arctic, uh, we can't be exclusive uh, to anything. We, we do have to take uh, a very integrated approach as we go forward. Thanks. So um, here's a question online from uh, Lisa Guy. It says, do you expect that zooplankton advected into the Chukchi and Beaufort Sea from further south in the Bering Sea will continue to be a stable food source for Arctic uh, planktivores like bowhead whales and seabirds as long as aragonite saturation remains relatively high in the southern Bering Sea? That's a great question that we don't know the answer to, and that gets back to Guillermo's question of whether or not uh, those types of studies will be included in an observing network, and I think the answer is absolutely they have to be, because we truly don't know that if you're talking about a pteropod uh, that's been uh, living in a higher aragonite saturation state environment that suggestively gets transported into the Chukchi Sea, which has lower saturation states, We've seen in the ocean that those pteropods respond to that changing conditions within 24 hours. So it's a very quick response that their shell can start to dissolve uh, when they're taken out of a higher aragonite environment and put into a lower or undersaturated aragonite environment. So that's an area of study that, that we have to move towards as quickly as we possibly can to constrain uh, the impact that um, th these changes will have on those zooplankton because they are an important food source uh, for the higher trophic levels. Any other questions uh, online or here in the room? All right, here's one. So from uh, Andre Ricardo dos Santos uh, says, uh, NOAA can provide, can provide any, or can NOAA provide any process to implement this intelligence in other important world regions, uh, for example, in the tropics? Uh, yes, we certainly hope so. There's uh, the ocean acidification program that's run uh, by Libby Jewett uh, is certainly providing that framework and, and that support. And that was the whole idea of the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network that Go On was specifically built uh, to provide that framework uh, and that information. So if you haven't already looked, please go to the, to the Go On website and you can find that linked off of the NOAA ocean acidification homepage, uh, and, and I think there's a wealth of information there um, related to that. Great. Um, let's see, John Engels asks, uh, could you elaborate a little more on the buffering capacity of oceans and how glacial runoff might be providing larger amounts of calcium carbonates with warming climates? Uh, sure. So that's, that question is actually has an incorrect premise in it. The glacial meltwater has low carbonate, or at least tidewater glacial melt, so these are glaciers that are melting directly into the ocean. They're not running down a stream bed uh, or across the land. And because of that, uh, they have virtually no total alkalinity uh, in the meltwater itself. And total alkalinity is that buffering capacity that prevents pH change and a decrease in saturation state. So when you dump a bunch of fresh glacial meltwater into an area like Prince William Sound, it lowers the pH and it lowers the saturation state because it is naturally, the water itself is naturally low in carbonate uh, mineral concentration. So that's another effect of climate change that you can relate to ocean acidification, that warming is causing higher rates of glacial melt, which is increasing the freshwater flow.
into these coastal environments, which is exacerbating the ocean acidification that's being driven by the rising carbon dioxide levels. So do you see um, a, a seasonal effect based on the uh, seasonal concentrations of carbon dioxide uh, um, and in terms of the effect on the ocean acidification or are the uh, changes in the local ecosystems more uh, pronounced in terms of how things change over the year? We absolutely see a seasonal effect and I showed that with the slide of the mooring where we had the, the ocean acidification mooring sitting outside Resurrection Bay where you can see in the summertime when the biological productivity really kicks off that draws down carbon dioxide levels in the surface water and undoes some of that ocean acidification effect. So those organisms get a reprieve for that number of months uh, because CO2 concentrations are lower and carbonate mineral saturation states are higher. There's a flip side to that coin though, is that all that biological productivity, all that biomass that gets created has to go somewhere. And so it sinks and it gets down into the bottom water and it's respired and the organic carbon is turned back into inorganic carbon, into CO2, and that CO2 suppresses pH and the saturation states near the bottom. So while the phytoplankton are doing this great service in the surface waters by lowering CO2, the biological pump then takes over and pumps all that carbon down to depth. And that's why we're seeing in places like the Bering Sea and the Chukchi Sea that are relatively shallow, they have high productivity at the surface, but then all that Productivity dies and sinks, and when it gets into the bottom water and it's respired and broken down, it drives saturation states down uh, very quickly, and that's where we become worried uh, about the benthic environment in those locations. So, Bob, we got a question in the back here. Yeah, all right. Another quick question. Um, so, you you showed early on in one of your charts that demonstrated that ocean acidification is more of a problem at the poles than at the equatorial regions. Uh, are there species in the Antarctic that are responding to ocean acidification in a manner that's different from species in the Arctic? And are there ways to learn lessons or, or new opportunities presented by that? Well, yes, there are opportunities, but I would say we're seeing similarities in the way that the, the animals are responding. So the pteropod, the little free swimming snail that I showed you, we found from the Southern Ocean all the way up to the North Pacific, those pteropods are responding to ocean acidification in the same way. They're dissolving, the shells are breaking down when they're exposed to conditions where aragonite is undersaturated. So the first demonstration of that was down in the Southern Ocean off of Antarctica. Now we've seen that same phenomenon happening up in the North Pacific. So um, it's the consistency of the response of the organism uh, that I think is, is concerning, is that there doesn't seem to be um, a species niche where we're seeing, well, some things are, are, you know, a pteropod in the Antarctic is doing fine where a pteropod in the Arctic is struggling. They seem to have a, a mutual um, tendency uh, to struggle when they're exposed to those undersaturated conditions. They're different, well, they're the same overall species, but there are different, you know, um, genetic characteristics of the different species, um, but they are responding the same way. But you bring up a good question. Um, there are deep water corals in the high latitude Pacific and off of Antarctica, and these deep water corals naturally exist in high CO2, low carbonate mineral saturation state environments, and, and they thrive and do very well. So that may give us some indication of what a future earth coral reef system may look like if the corals that currently exist in the tropics are struggling as pH and saturation states change, maybe the deep water corals uh, that have evolved and developed in naturally high CO2 environments will expand out you know, and their habitat will increase. And that gets back to your question of the winners and losers is, is that those deep water corals in the high latitudes uh, may give us a, a very strong indication of what a future earth coral reef system will look like. Any other questions? All right, well, if not, uh, please join me in thanking uh, Jeremy again for a fantastic and really interesting presentation. Thank you all for coming. So um, just to conclude, I want to remind everybody to uh, please uh, complete the evaluations that you received.
um, when you came in or will, which will appear on your computer once you uh, leave the webinar. And also I'll remind you that we are continuing this series uh, next month on uh, um, Thursday, 28th, April 28th, which a, a presentation from uh, Ted Schur, who is at Northern Arizona University. Whoops. Um, he's at Northern Arizona University. And let me just quickly pull that back up again. Uh, oh, well. Um, and uh, he'll be talking about uh, changes in the permafrost and the impact on the environment. Um, also, I would remind you to uh, um, take a look at the Arcus webpage at www.arcus.org and uh, invite you to uh, consider becoming a member of our organization. We'd love to have you. And uh, thank you so much for your participation today and have a great uh, rest of your day. Thanks.